Well, hi, everybody. Paul M. Newberger, CEO of the Young Guns Movement, as well as the host of YG One on One right here on YG TV. Like a bad penny, we're back here with Tim Stewart, my friend, partner at DeWitt Law Firm, to continue our enlightening conversation about ESOPs. Tim, wonderful to have you again. Thank you. Great to be back. Yeah, well, I appreciate you walking us through kind of like ESOP 101, I suppose, in the first conversation. Today, I want to get a little bit more granular, so I hope you brought your A-game, because I've had some time to think up some additional questions Always for you. Always on it. I'm ready to go. You're never off, I guess. I'm, I'm, Not when it comes to ESOP. No, I've become accustomed to that. So my, my first question to get us going, so you introduced us to ESOPs in our last conversation, but can we talk about the financial side of ESOPs for a moment, if you don't mind? So from a financial perspective, what are the big differences between selling your business to an ESOP versus other sorts of business sales? Yeah, so there's really two main differences in terms of the taxation. And we already talked about this in the last discussion, but the ability to turn your company into a for-profit but tax-exempt organization, essentially, um, is an amazing and powerful tool for financing because whether you're whether the company owes you a promissory note and or owes the bank money from the transaction, the company's ability to pay that down, you and the bank, is really, really helped by the fact that they're no longer paying taxes. So that's number one. The second part is a direct benefit, a direct tax benefit to you as the seller, which is, um, in a stock transaction, which all ESOP transactions are stock transactions, you're selling your stock to the ESOP. Um, in that situation, the tax treatment is always capital gains treatment. So what does that mean? Capital gains treatment right now is around, in 2020, is around 29, 30% all in state and federal. However, if you were to sell your business in an asset sale to a third party, whether it's a private equity firm or a strategic buyer, now you're talking at least partially going to have some ordinary income taxation, which could be up to 50%. So as a seller, you're much better off as far as after-tax proceeds if you do a stock sale. So for a guy that, that does this for a living, I mean, this is pretty much all you do specifically. So you get right. extremely granular with this. You see a lot of different stuff that's going on there in the marketplace. Are there any particular industries where you're seeing a rise in the number of ESOP deals? And if so, any reason for that increase? Yeah, it is very interesting to see uh, what industries gravitate toward ESOP transactions and why. So most recently, uh, general contractors and subcontractors, basically the construction world, are doing a lot of ESOP transactions. We've seen it in craft brewing, the craft brewing world. We've seen it in community banks. Um, and in those situations, you're talking about industries which are sort of tight-knit, meaning they talk to each other a lot. In, with regard to the construction industry, that's been an industry that's been on the rise and making a lot of money over the last, I, I really since 2013, 2014. And, and so they've got profitable companies. However, there's traditionally not a lot of M&A, meaning, meaning merger and acquisition activity in the construction world. Private equity doesn't usually go after, especially in the small to medium construction uh, market. They don't invest in there. They don't buy those sorts of companies. And there's not a whole lot of consolidation in those companies. So a lot of these companies have very profitable, solid companies that are great sales candidates, but they have no one to sell it to. So an ESOP turns into a great uh, uh, solution for those sorts of business owners. Well, and I think you kind of stole my thunder there because one of the questions I was going to ask is why the construction industry particular? Did you already kind of answer that? Or is there anything else you can elaborate in terms of why that industry has seen so much of this activity? I think that's, I, I answered it partially. The other part of it though, I, what is what I was talking about with craft brewing, craft brewing world and, and, the, and community banks is uh, they get together uh, and, and they know each other very well. And so when and this happens in the ESAP world, we see this happening a lot. Someone does an ESAP that you know, and you say, well, their business is a lot like my business, why can't I do an ESAP? And they find out they can do an ESAP. It is purely an educational gap um, about, that is prohibiting or, or, or preventing a lot of these businesses from considering doing ESAP. So in the construction world, you do see a lot of, of, of talk between and among companies uh, in that industry. So you, you talk about the, talking that these individuals do, the, the word of mouth, I suppose, conversations that take place from organizations like that. Is that, ex is that 
common in the world of ESOP or is that, uh, yeah. are there other ways that people are finding out about your services? So clearly we in the ESOP community, which is a small community, are a loud minority where we try to tell everybody how great ESOPs are. And that, ha like we're doing right now. But um, the most, I think, effective uh, way for ESOPs to spread is word of mouth between and among business owners that have sold to ESOPs. And so I've seen this over and over again where you have CEO roundtables or tech groups or, or those sorts of, of things where one person does it, one business owner sells to an ESOP and, the, and then suddenly two people and then three people all in the same group and, it's, it, and it kind of goes that way. I should also say though that there is an entire, a gigantic industry um, the M in the M&A market called investment banking that employs thousands of people across the country to help you sell your business, not to an ESOP, but to a third party. And so I said, we are a loud minority. That's a loud majority. And so that's sort of why you don't hear as much about ESOPs and you hear much more about businesses selling to third parties. Well, and as we start coming to the conclusion of our second conversation about ESOPs, I mean, everything you're saying makes a ton of sense. It seems like ESOPs with the right organization, with the right individual, could definitely be a worthwhile way for them to proceed. There's a lot of good stuff going on in the ESOP community. You talk about word of mouth, et cetera. Despite all of that, why, why aren't ESOPs more common than they already are? A lot of good stuff, a lot of good yeah. reasons to do it, but why aren't they even more common than what you're seeing today? Well, there is a big education gap. I've joked with people uh, in the ESOP world that we, we should start talking about ESOPs and teaching ESOPs in school because it is such a, a great way for, as I mentioned in, in our last episode, where everybody wins. The employees win, the sellers win, the, the suppliers and the, the, the um, vendors to the, co to the company also win. Um, but you, you just have this perception, and it's almost all entirely perception, that ESOPs are too complicated, and well, that's good for someone else, but it's not good for me. And so that's, that sort of momentum or lack of momentum is, is the reason there aren't more ESOPs today. And that's something we're trying to do. There's something like 11,000 or 7,000 ESOPs in the country today and over 5 million businesses. So that put, that's a minuscule percentage of businesses that are ESOPs. We feel like it should be much more than that. Well, I'll tell you, if they ever start teaching ESOPs in schools or educational institutions, you're just the man to teach it, Tim Stewart. I'm going to start calling you the professor of ESOPs, if that's okay with you. Uh, I've joked with my children that they're going to be the ones that, that are going to be teaching. The, teaching it. When I'm retired, they'll be teaching, uh, maybe become teachers and teach ESOPs. Sure. Well, if, whether we're teaching kids or, or teaching our audience, I really do appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to educate us, to educate the audience here at YGTV about the importance of ESOPs. Very enlightening stuff. I know I learned a lot, and I really appreciate your expertise here today. Thank you. Well, if you enjoyed this level of expertise, and with Tim Stewart on the program, how could you not? You would love the content on YGTV, Young Guns Television. Please feel free to subscribe today. It's totally free. Why the heck would you not want to get access to this game-changing content where we aspire to break the rules of business? Among other programs, catch my show, YG One-on-One, -on -one, hosted by yours truly, Paul M. Newberger. If you can't get enough Tim Stewart, if you can't get enough of DeWitt Law Firm, and quite honestly, when could you ever? Please feel free to join us for an upcoming networking event. More details will be shared soon. It's going to be our March Legacy and Loyalty event hosted by our friends at DeWitt. You're not going to want to miss that. In the meantime, I'm Paul M. Newberger. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you around soon.